Thank you very much, Mike. Yes, as Mike said, I'm going to talk to you about SWIFTs first of all, give, give you some idea about their life cycle, all we know about them, and then talk about what Hampshire SWIFTs are doing to conserve them and what you can do to help them. Next slide, please. So swifts belong to a family of birds called the Apodidae, which means no feet. They've got some similarities to swallows and martins, but they're not in fact closely related to them. Their nearest relatives are the hummingbirds. There are 92 species and they're found on all continents except Antarctica. Next. They're very dark birds, blackish brown all over, except for a small pale grey patch under their chin. And one of their characteristics is their amazing long swept back scimitar shaped wings. And another important characteristic is their way they scream. They form what are known as screaming parties when they fly very fast between buildings in their nesting area. And that's when you hear those screaming parties, it's a very good indication that there are nests nearby. Next. Here's an image of swifts along with sand martins, house martins and swallows. And you can see that although maybe if you see them from a distance, they are similar, they, they do look pretty different. Their tails are very different. The color of their feathers is very different and their wing shape are different. Next. Swifts spend almost all their lives in the air. They're the fastest bird in level flight, up to 69 miles an hour. Obviously, peregrines are faster, but only when they're stooping. In, fl in level flight, swifts beat them. They do nearly everything on the wing. So they sleep, mate, and feed on the wing. And the only time they land on purpose is in order to nest. They fly about 500 miles a day on average. Next. Their scientific name, Apus, which is Greek, means no feet. And of course, they do have feet. They have very tiny feet and very short legs, but they're hopeless for perching. So they can't perch. So you can, you'll never see a swift in a tree or on a telegraph wire. But those claws allow them to hang on to vertical surfaces such as walls, which is very useful when they're looking for a nest site. Next. They have a very wide distribution right the way across Europe, North Africa and into parts of Asia for breeding. And in the winter, they spend their winter in Africa. Next. We know where they go in Africa, thanks to the invention of geolocators. And here's an image of a swift wearing a tiny geolocator on its back. Next. This image shows a diagram of the journey of one particular swift, which was tracked using for, by the British Trust for Ornithology. And subsequently, they've tracked many hundreds more swifts. And that's a very, this is a very typical journey for them. What the image shows is where they go in the autumn, where they spend the winter and how they return. And the size of the circles on the map indicates the amount of time that they spent in particular areas. What the tracking has shown is that in autumn, they tend to migrate down the North Atlantic coast across Northern Africa. And then they have a huge wintering range. They spend a lot of time in the Congo Basin, but they also go right over to the other side of Africa, a really big range in winter. In spring, which they start heading back towards um, the UK or the rest of Europe, really about the beginning of April, they have an important stopover over Liberia and they spend a lot of time feeding up there. They arrive there just when there's a mass emergence of insects after the rain and that helps keep them well fueled as they get um, on towards the Sahara. It's also shown, these tracking studies, how incredibly fast they are. So one swift they tracked took only five days to travel from West Africa back to the UK. Next. They arrive in Britain 
usually at the end of April, beginning of May, and then by early August, they're starting to go. And that's a much shorter period than Swallows or House Martins or San Martins, all of whom arrive much earlier in April and stay often into late September, early October. In fact, this is the shortest period in the UK of any of our migrant birds. Next. They feed on insects high up in the sky. This is what's, what's known as aerial plankton. So little tiny spiders, small insects of various sorts, and they feed up to several hundred meters. Next. They drink like this, so they need access to water nearby where they can do this amazing uh, fast flow really over the surface of the water to get water. Next. They start breeding when they're four, so in their fourth calendar year. They pair for life, but they don't spend the winter together. Interestingly, they separate when they leave the nest and then they meet up again back at the nest after spending the winter in Africa. They're site faithful, so they use the same nest site every year, ideally. They only have one brood a year, usually two chicks, but sometimes three. And they live on average between six and 10 years. They're the oldest named swift, which was a swift that had been ringed, was 21, so a really good age. Next. Now, they used to live, nest in holes in trees and on cliffs. This was 2000 or so years ago, but now only a very, very small number nest in such situations. There's a few in who nest in old woodpecker holes in ancient pine forests in the Abernethy forest in Scotland and in forests in Poland. And some nest in cracks in quarries or cliffs. And in fact, recently we found some that were nesting in a motorway bridge. <laughs> but in general, that's pretty rare now. They really rely on buildings. Next. So, as I said, they rely on buildings for nest sites. And another important characteristic of a swift is that you can't see its nest from outside. So if you think you see a swift nest, it won't be a swift. It'll be possibly a house martin or a swallow. So all you can see is the nest entrance. And this is an example of one that I filmed in Winchester. And you can see there's quite a big gap under the tiles there where the swifts got in. And I'm going to show you some other examples of places where they nest. Next. So holes in soffits. Next. Holes behind down pipes at the top of under eaves. Next. Holes in brickwork. This is a, on a council estate in Winchester. And again, holes in the soffit. And here, this is a very interesting site where there used to be central heating pipes in those holes. They were sort of overflow pipes. And when they were removed, the Swifts discovered that these could provide nest sites. So they're in effect nesting under the floors of these flats. Next, under tiles. Next, under soffits. This is a very, very popular place. So they get in under the gap between the wall and the soffit gives them enough room and they either nest on top of the wall plate or on top of the soffit itself. Next. And this is a very unusual one. This is a very modern building in Winchester where Swifts have discovered there are little gaps right at the peaks of this building where they can nest. And you can see that the residents of this building are not very bird friendly. Look, lots of anti-pigeon spikes everywhere. But despite this, the Swifts nest here very successfully. Next. And here it is. This is a building quite near the cathedral in Winchester. It's called Mazetta. It's a block of flats. And each of those peaks now has a swift nest in it. So there are six pairs nesting here. Next. If you could see inside a swift nest, this is what you'd see. So this is a typical swift nest. It's made out of what they can catch in the air. So 
usually just a few feathers, sometimes a few bits of grass, and they bind it all together with saliva. But in general, it's a pretty rudimentary nest in comparison to many of the garden birds we see. This particular nest was filmed in the hospital of St Cross, Winchester, where we've got um, quite a good colony now of swifts. Next. When they're collecting insects for their chicks, they store them in a pouch in their throat. And you can see in this image of a swift that its pouch is really quite swollen. So it's now got a big lump of insects in that. And the picture on the right of the screen actually shows a bolus of insects that contains up to a thousand insects. And this particular one was found by a man who's got lots of swift nest boxes on his house. And very fortunately, he happened to be standing underneath them one day when a swift dropped this as it was going overhead, aiming to get into its nest to feed its chicks. And so he was able to balance it on his finger and take a photograph of it. And you can see, if you look closely, you can see eyes of flies and all sorts of things. But you can see, too, how many insects there are in that bolus of food. Next. Now, at this point, I was hoping to show you a video of swifts bringing back food for their chicks. But it looks as if it's not going to play because you can't even see the still from the video. So anyway, there it is. <laughs> So here is parent bird coming into the nest. This is a nest in the hospital of St Cross where we've got a camera. And so we filmed all sorts of wonderful goings on in this nest. But unfortunately, I think you won't be able to see it. Well, try it. You try Mike just pressing down, see if it happens. No, it won't work. I'm very sorry about that. Anyway, if you go back again. <laughs> sorry. And now on to the next one. Sorry. Now, rearing swift chicks takes a long time, far longer than most other birds. It takes at least nine weeks. The picture on the left shows very, very young swift chicks. These are probably one or two days old. And the picture on the right shows them when they're a bit more developed, but still got a long way to go. Next. And the reason it takes so long is that they have to be able to fly perfectly the moment they leave the nest. They can't, like other birds, um, fly partially and, and then hop around on the ground. They have to be able to fly completely well when they set off. And in order to do that, they exercise and strengthen their wings doing press ups. And they start doing this at quite a young age and do them increasingly often as they get older. Next. And here I was going to be able to show you a very short video of a chick doing press ups, but unfortunately you won't be able to see it. But it was the bird on the left of the screen and it's a lovely profile shot of this little bird putting all its weight on the tips of its wings and sort of pressing down with its on its wings and then lifting its tail up in the air to strengthen its wing muscles. And meanwhile, its sibling is asleep on the other side of the nest site. Next. And here I was going to show you one last little video of a swift family the night before they all set off on their separate ways. So there's a parent and two chicks on the other side. And one of the endearing things about swift is when they're in the nest together, they, they cuddle together a lot. They do lots of snuggling down together before they go to sleep. And they preen each other on their heads like little kisses, which is very endearing, I find, to watch. And I was that was going to be a little example of it. But unfortunately, we can't show you that. Next. And here's a swift chick actually fledging. And you know it's a chick partly because it's got a very, very white chin. And they have that very white chin so that the parents can see them in the dark and know where to aim the food. But also you can see it's got a white tip to its wing. All their feathers and their, when they're young are edged with in white uh, and that gradually wears off as they get a bit older. And once they leave the nest, it'll be at least three years before they land again. Next. Now swifts, as you probably know, are facing a really catastrophic decline. 
Since 1994, when this data was first gathered by the British Trust for Ornithology, they've declined by 62% in the UK as a whole, and even more by 70% in the southeast of the country. And so far, there's no indication of that decline really halting and certainly not um, going up again, lessening. Next. So what drives the decline? Well, one of the most obvious ones, perhaps, is, is it reduction in insects? Because we know that many insect populations are declining due to a whole combination of things like habitat loss, pollution, pesticides, climate change. And there's a lot of studies throughout Europe showing decline in insects. But there's no evidence yet that swifts are being less successful at rearing chicks. That comes from data from um, swift groups who monitor um, their colonies. And so we don't think that that's important yet, but it clearly will become important if the decline in insects persist. We think the most important cause of the decline, and our views are shared by quite a lot of other scientists, is loss of nest places. And the reason for this is that every year, thousands of swift nest sites are lost because buildings are demolished, roofs are repaired or renovated, and particularly the installation of UPVC soffits and fascias. Next. So here's an example. This is a, a building site, a house in Winchester, where I used to watch the swifts every year going into that house as shown on the left-hand side. And of course, that roof did need repair. And unfortunately, a few years ago, it was repaired. And I went and knocked on the house door and it turned out that the owners didn't realise they had swifts nesting there. And unfortunately, they weren't actually very interested in helping them. So they didn't want to push up a nest box. So when the swifts came back that year, they had to look for another place. Next. And here's another example of how easy it is to destroy a nest site. Both these houses in Winchester used to have swifts nesting under the soffit in that gap between the soffit and the brickwork. Um, one site is still in use, but the other site is now gone because of new plastic soffits installed. Next. And the reason plastic soffits and fascias and barge boards are so hopeless for birds is they fit so tightly to the brickwork. There's no, there's no room, there are no gaps, and there won't be any gaps over time because unlike wood, plastic doesn't um, shrink at all with time. So they are really bad news in general for birds that nest in cavities in buildings. Next. So why does it matter if we lose swift nest places? Surely they can look for another nest. Well, it matters because they rely on the availability of a known nest site that they use year after year. If they return to find that site destroyed, they may not be able to find a new nest site in time to breed that year. It may be in the past that wasn't a problem and there were enough sites around that they could always find a new gap in a house. But now it's really quite difficult, especially in areas where lots of houses are kept in very good condition and people have renovated their roofs, put new soffits and fascias up. It's, it's really difficult for swifts often to find a new place to nest. And as I said, it takes a long time to rear um, a swift chick from laying the egg to fledging. And so they may think, well, I haven't got time. We won't bother to breed this year. Next. One of the difficulties is that modern houses are built in such a way, they're designed to be energy efficient, that they very rarely have gaps or crevices for swifts or sparrows or starlings, for that matter, to nest in. Next. So for swifts, unlike most bird species whose nests are dispensable, they're short term, swifts depend absolutely on having a known nest site in order to breed successfully. So if we can preserve existing nest sites and create new ones, then effectively we can conserve 
the species. Next. Hampshire Swifts was set up in 2016 with the aim of stopping the decline of these wonderful birds. Next. We do various things to try and conserve them. One of them is the Hampshire Swift Survey. Next. Which is a database of the precise location of swift nests across the country. And it's critical to know where swifts are nesting because it's only if you know where they nest that you can protect them. Anybody can enter data on, the, on nest sites. And we're very welcome, we're very grateful to everybody who does that for us. Every year, all our records are given to the Hampshire Biodiversity Information Centre, and then they're used to inform um, ecologists and planners who are working on new developments. What we've shown in the Hampshire Swift Survey is that most towns do have some breeding swifts, but they tend to be concentrated in just a few suitable properties, and that makes them very vulnerable. Next. And here's an example. Now you won't be able to see the detail on this slide very clearly. What it is, is a map of a big council estate in Winchester, which was built in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And probably in its heyday, nearly all these houses would have had room for swifts. But when we did this survey just a few years ago, that swifts were confined to just three roads in this very, really quite big area. There were a lot of nest sites there, 65 plus nest sites, but they were limited to 37 houses. Next. Another major part of our work is making and installing nest boxes. So we'll put nest boxes up on any suitable building. We've installed well over a thousand so far. And we do it for what Chris Packham referred to as the conservation bargain of the year. It's only £35 to have a box put up for you. Swifts will readily use nest boxes if the site is appropriate. So you need to have a clear drop of at least 4.5 metres below the box. So bungalows are usually no good. And you need ample clear airspace near the box. Next. The big plus of putting up nest boxes for swifts is that they also help house sparrows because like swifts, house sparrows too are red listed because they've declined so much they're in danger of extinction. Sparrows adore swift boxes. I've got four swift boxes on my house and they're all occupied by sparrows. Next. The other thing we do is to provide nest boxes to compensate for loss of natural nest sites. So we have got an arrangement with Winchester City Council so that all their tenants are offered swift boxes when their houses are re-roofed and have their soffits replaced. Because if we didn't do that, then that house would never again be able to host a swift or a sparrow pair in, their, in that building. Next. We've also got two quite large projects where we make bespoke internal nest boxes. One of these is at the Hospital of St Cross in Winchester, where we started a project in 2018 to try and increase the population of swifts there. They used to have swifts nesting there in quite large numbers, but at some point they would put up wire mesh under the eaves to prevent jackdaws getting into the lofts of the buildings. And of course that has stopped the swifts getting in as well. Next. So to start it with, we installed 15 nest boxes in the gaps between the rafters. So you can't see anything from outside, apart from if you peer closely, you can see the opening of the nest box. And the swifts fly straight into the nest boxes and then they're contained within that. They can't get into the loft itself. And we used a core player system to attract the swifts to the nest boxes. Next. And this project is being very successful. The first year we had two pairs of swifts breeding. 2021, we had eight pairs breeding and a couple of pairs made nests for next year. Because what swifts do when they're 
not quite ready to breed, they will make, um, but they've paired up, they will make a nest and then return to it the following year to actually breed for the first time. And then this year, nine pairs bred and four sexually immature pairs made nests already for when they come back next year. And we've expanded the number of nest boxes there. So there are now 35 nest boxes. So it's a wonderful place to go and visit in the summer. You can sit underneath the nest boxes and have coffee because there's a very nice tea shop there and listen to the swifts zooming around. Next. The other place where we put internal nest boxes is in the tower of Winchester Cathedral. So in 2020, we installed 20 swift nest boxes behind the louvers in the bell tower. Next. So the first year we were able to have, um, we had just one pair reared young in, this, in these 20 boxes and one pair created a nest all ready to come back to you next year. And this year, just last earlier, a few days ago, we went up to the tower and opened all the nest boxes to see how many had been used. And amazingly, 18 of them, of the 20, showed signs that swifts had actually entered the boxes. Two, had, two pairs had, had reared young and five had made a complete nest, but not actually reared young. And there were others which has had a few feathers in. So it just shows they're very, very keen on this particular nest site. It's a really good site, very high up. Um, and they probably feel quite safe up there, even though it is quite near the nest of the peregrines who also nest on the cathedral. Next. We also provide advice on installing integral swift bits bricks in buildings to provide permanent nest sites. These are perfect for new builds, but you can also put them, if you're building an extension, um, you can put them in the extension if you've got um, sufficient height. And they're used really by a variety of crevice nesting birds. So they can be used by house sparrows, by great tits, by blue tits. So they're now used, recognized as a universal nest brick and so we recommend them to um, people who are keen to help these birds. Next, we do a lot of work on planning. So there are 15 planning authorities in Hampshire, each of which have a local plan at various stages of development. And we lobby councils to persuade them to make it a condition of planning approval specified in the local plan that swift bricks are included. And you've now got an opportunity because Southampton is developing its local plan at the moment. So this is your opportunity to write to them and say, please include swift bricks. Other councils already do help swifts in this way, but there are far few, too few of them. We need every council really to do this. As part of our work, we monitor all planning applications in Hampshire, and then we submit comments on all appropriate applications requesting that integral swift bricks are installed in the sort of numbers that are considered appropriate for, um, to help swifts. It should be at least one brick per dwelling. Next. And we have had some success with this. So in Winchester, for example, we've been working with Carla Holmes, who have, are building a big over 3000 home development in Winchester. Who, they resisted our attempts at first to make them put swift books in, but by using social media and basically shaming them, I think, they completely capitulated and they've come up with this wonderful urban wildlife strategy where every house will have a swift brick and a bat brick and there will be hedgehog highways and bee bricks and it's more than we could have hoped for and they're now rolling that out right the way across the country because they're pleased with it themselves um, which is really excellent news for swifts in any place where Carla Homes are building homes. Next, so what can you do to help Swifts. Well, 
obviously preserve existing nest sites if you can. We're always happy to come and advise you. If you need to repair your roof, but know you've got swifts nesting there, we'll come and advise you. Push up swift boxes, we'll come and do it for you, only 35 pounds. Persuade your neighbors to have swift boxes. And you can also consider creating new nest sites if you have your soffits and fascias replaced. Next. Because it's perfectly possible to put new nest sites in, in the new soffits. And here's an example. This is a house that's actually um, owned by the um, chief executive of the Hampshire Wildlife Trust, Debbie Tan. And she had swifts nesting in her house and was very keen to protect them and provide more nest sites for other swifts but also needed her soffits and fascias replaced. And so Hampshire Swifts advised her on how to do it. And a firm called Fascia Division, who work all over the South, did the work and they did it wonderfully. So she's now got six new nest sites and her old nest site has been preserved. So that's something to aim for, I think. We need more firms to offer this sort of um, help to nesting birds. Next. And what else can you do to help swifts? Well, if you have a planning application going on near you, you could write to them and say, please ask for swift bricks to be included. Ask your local council to include swift bricks in their local plan. And also at the moment, there's a petition doing the rounds where we're trying to get the government to make swift bricks compulsory in new housing. And I've given the details, a link on this petition, um, to Kath, and I hope you'll all get it if you haven't seen it already. Next. Here's the link. Um, and when I did this, when I copied this, it was 16 odd thousand, but it's already up to 18,000 since I did this. So it, it's doing well, but we want to get it up to 100,000 because then it'll have to be debated in Parliament. Next. Because all this is what our swifts need they need your help we can't they can't do it without without us all helping them thank you